On four seventeen from where? Because I came from Lake Mary on four seventeen, and there was. Are you ready? Yep. Good morning. I'm glad that everybody could make it to the program. We have some folks in classrooms, some folks in the uh, on the webinar. So if you have any questions on the webinar, if you would please, I will give you, um, point out at this point in time that my email address is up, that you can feel free to email me with any questions that you have. I ask one major, major favor. When you email me any questions, please put in your subject line, student with question, so that I know that I need to return your email as quickly as possible. So again, my email address is up on the screen, lisamhar at gmail.com, and any questions that you have, um, I will not be seeing them as we go through the program, so if you would wait until the end and just email them to me, so that I might be able to respond to you, I would be happy to do so. All right, we are going to talk about addenda today. And the addenda are addenda to the sell and purchase contract. I want to go over just a couple of things before we do that. And we are having some technical difficulty. All right, there we go. Hopefully everybody can see it. The purpose of the addenda is pretty straightforward. Make changes to the original contract and make the original contract more strict by use of the addenda. That's what you should be using addenda for. You do not use addenda to create all kinds of interesting new clauses because the very important thing that you need to understand about using addenda to contracts is that according to Florida contract law, anything that is written or typed is going to supersede, meaning that it is going to be taken as the law over anything that was originally there. And that is the very important thing that I want you to get from this. Because when you start writing things in or adding things to any one of the contracts, if you're not careful, you could negate entire clauses of the contract. Since we are the real estate professional and we are the ones, if we are the ones creating that in it, we are then held liable. So you need to be very careful. So what we're going to do over the next couple of hours is to look at all of the addenda that have already been created by or in conjunction with the Florida Real Estate Commission and with the Florida Bar Association that have the legalese already written into it and those should be your first options. I want you to ha understand how each one would be used, what the, the pluses and the negatives are for each of them and so you can determine for yourself how to use these. And again, that is the purpose. I want you to learn the one to use the ones that are already pre-done as opposed to using ones that you're trying to create for yourself because creating ones for yourself and putting language in there makes you liable because you did it unless you have a Juris Doctorate. You're not permitted to write any of these things. So be very, very careful. There are a few that you should consider using all the time. And we're going to talk about each one of these, so I just want to point them out quickly. The Homeowners Association, you should always look at using that. That needs to be something that you tell yourself every contract that has to be there. 
if you don't receive it on the buying side of a transaction, if the listing agent doesn't send it over to you, then you need to be adding it. If you are the listing agent and you have not seen one come through, you didn't send one, you forgot about it, you didn't see one come from the buyer's representative, then you need to make sure that it's there. That one needs to be part of every transaction. And let me just be very clear on this. It doesn't matter if there is no homeowners association. Okay, I'll say that again. Even if the property has no homeowners association, that particular addenda will address any of the um, the, any of the, the different conveyances with the property, anything that, that is going to be there as far as the property, so it needs to be part of it. All right? The right to inspect needs to be there to cover you as a realtor. If the homeowner chooses, buyer says, I don't care about having an inspection, fine. Just have them sign off on it that they knew that they had the right, they chose not to, and we move forward, especially on the ones that you're doing as is contracts. Okay, we're going to talk about the insurance, we're going to talk about mold, and we're going to talk about backup contracts and kickout clauses. And those two do go hand in hand. So if you're using one, you have to use the other. And you always want to make sure that would be something that I'm going to, going to look at from the side of the listing agent to protect your sellers. So we are going to talk about each of these. And again, as we go through, I'm sure you're going to have some com comments or some questions. Um, obviously, I'll restate the ones for anybody here in the classroom so that everybody can hear. But those of you that are participating via webinar, please write yours down. Now, all of these, all of the addenda can be found you know, right, on, right on the Internet. So you don't have to go looking for these. You all have access to them. Please use them. Okay, please use them. And a couple reminders. I know I've said this once, but you know, adults have to hear things at least four times before they remember it because we usually only understand or grasp 25% of what we're told. So use addenda only when needed, and so you don't create a liable situation for you or your customer. And also, do not write your own. Unless you have a Juris Doctorate degree, you should not be writing your own. You should be using something that has been pre-done, pre-approved by FAR and by the Florida Bar Association. All right. We're going to read them. We're going to talk about them. I will also remind you of something else. I know a lot of times whenever you're concerned or you're confused, you want to reach out and ask questions. You cannot or should not ask questions of anybody in your office with regard to a contract except your broker. And most of your offices have broker associates in them as the office manager, so that's fine. But you cannot ask other people about, you know, how should I write this in a contract? That is not a good idea to do. Broker, broker, broker. However, a lot of times I get students who will say, I call legal hotline. My broker wasn't available. I didn't know who else. I called legal hotline. The first question that they ask you on legal hotline is, are you a broker or are you a sales associate? And so here's the reason why they're going to answer your question differently. If you say you are a sales associate or a broker associate, that attorney that you are now speaking to is going to give you simply the interpretation of the law. I know what you have contacted them for is to say, but how do I write this in the contract? They can not legally tell you how to write it in the contract because the only person that can tell a broker or a broker associate how to write something in a contract is, say it with me everybody, your broker. Because that is the person who is legally representing the buyer and or the seller in the transaction. So the personal legal hotline cannot. If your broker calls legal hotline with the same question, now the attorney can actually answer how it should perhaps be written in the contract because they are speaking with the broker who is representing the buyer or the seller. I always want you to understand because I, here's what I hear frequently from, from students. I call legal hotline. If you call them three different times, you're going to get three different attorneys. You're going to get three different opinions. And none of them tells me 
how to actually write the contract. And that is because in the sales associate or broker associate, they cannot. Okay? So their conversation with your broker can be completely different than your conversation with legal hotline. Um, just always remember that. When in doubt, there's one person that you can go to and can get advice from, and that is your broker. Period. And that's just the way our laws are written in Florida. So don't practice law without a degree. Okay? That's kind of the big thing. So let's go to... few of these and pull this up so we can see. I'm going to start with the comprehensive addendum. And I want to start with this because it starts with the, it just goes A through Z, if you will. And as you can see, there are 31 addenda if you pull up this packet. So you only have to go to mostly one place and get everything. The very first one is your condominium rider. Any time that you are going to be working with a purchase and sale contract on a condo, you know that this has to be attached, period. There's no other way around it. It has to be attached. Okay? It is going to matter and will be filled out differently based on certain things. If the condominium association has a first right of refusal, all of those things will have to be checked. But if you are on the buying side, you are sending over a contract on a condo, this must be attached. I also want you to understand that you're filling in the top portion of this. And your buyer is going to initial that they're sending it. Okay? Not signing it, sending it. So, again, the very first section of this, it talks about the association approval. And they may have requirements of things that have to be sent over um, so that they can determine if this contract can move forward. The first right of refusal, the association may have a first right of refusal, which means that the association has the right to actually purchase the condo um, in the name of the association first. And if they choose not to, then it can move forward to other contracts. And there are provisions within that. So you do have some condo associations that that is what they do. Um, that's how they were set up initially. So you do, you will have to look at that. Fees and assessments is the big reason that we attach this. Okay, and I want you to look at this. Seller represents that the current association assessments installments are. I'm going to stop there and make sure you heard what I just read. You, working on the buyer's side, are sending over this with your sale and purchase contract. The seller is supposed to complete this so that your buyer has an accurate piece of information. This talks about monthly of more than one association assessment. So a lot of your condo communities are within a larger community. So they're going to pay a condo fee monthly and perhaps a quarterly association fee for the, uh, the rest of the neighborhood. Um, I live by Heathrow in Lake Mary and that's one of the big things there is condo fees are monthly and then there's a quarterly um, association fee to Heathrow. So those are important. There may be additional other fees for recreation where if you want to golf, you have to pay to golf. Uh, those are some of the things that we need to be aware of and that the seller, again, is responsible for that. Should this all be in the listing? Yes. But we all know sometimes the only thing that gets put into the listing, if anything, is just that monthly condo fee. And the other ones get eliminated. So that's what this is there to clarify and make sure that your buyer is well aware of this information and aware of what the fees are going to be. Okay. It also talks about special assessments. And this was special assessments are going to be if they're, um, they have to redo all of the, um, the uh, balconies because of erosion, because it's near the beach, or whatever it might be. 
and they're going to be do, charging an additional $1,000 per condo for the next 18 months. Uh, that's where that would go. But all of those are required to be written out, spelled out, and so your buyer has this information. And again, that's what this is all talking about as we go down through. Um, sprinkler retrofits, because that became a very important part of everything because of those new regulations, so that has to be disclosed if it's there. Non-developer disclosure. And this is, again, the buyer hereby acknowledges that buyer has been provided a current copy of the declaration of the condo, or B, the agreement is voidable by the buyer by delivering written notice to the buyer's intention to cancel within three days. So this is for new, new, you're getting all this information, you know for existing it's three days, for new it's 15. You learned that in your pre-license class. What I think everybody glosses over is, send this over, and for some reason, people think that if three days pass and you haven't received it, oh, well, too bad. Or at least that's what a lot of listing agents want you to understand. That is not true. This clearly says that your buyer gets this, reviews it, and has three days to review. Okay? Three calendar days to review. If they don't like it, they send this back saying, I'm out of the contract, and they are released, their money is returned, everything moves forward. It is, I don't care if the listing agent withheld this information for three weeks into the contract. Your buyer has three days once they receive it. That is the biggest reason why I'm going to kind of jump down here, just so you see, you know, that we are making sure that they don't uh, don't sign off on anything. Sorry, didn't mean to get rid of this. All right, so we want to make sure that we that we don't have them sign off on it until they receive everything. Okay, and then we have the buyer's request for documents. So you're you're literally, folks, just going down through here. The respect the inspection clauses are going to be the same. And here's the final one that I wanted to go over, is the governance form. As this clearly says, and they put it all in caps so it stands out, buyer is entitled to receive from seller a copy of the governance form. This is going to give the seller is going to send this over, usually directly from the, the folks at the condo, all the information about the governing document. Um, who is responsible, where all of the records are kept, how they vote, all of those kinds of things. That is required so that your buyer has that information and is aware of all that prior to them completing the sell and purchase contract. Okay? That, is, uh, that has been part of Florida law since 2010. So it's been in place for a while. I frequently see it still not happening. All right, the second, and this is one of the ones that if you are kind of keeping track, this is one that I said this must be attached to every single sale and purchase contract. The Homeowners Association Community Disclosure. And I think probably more importantly, community disclosure is, is the big thing. As this says, and I'm going to kind of jump down here into this, uh, this first paragraph where it says, uh, written notice of the buyer's intention to cancel within three days after receipt of the disclosure summary or prior to closing. Let me stop and explain this. This means that if our buyer has not received all of the information about the property, meaning the homeowners association or the restrictive covenants about this property, if they do not receive it, they have the right to cancel the entire contract. So if you are a listing agent, it is in your best interest to get this information and have it readily available. We all know we can attach documents whenever we take a listing. So I would strongly suggest to you that you move forward when you take a listing. And a lot of people say, well, the seller doesn't know this, that. Folks, just contact the title just contact the title company. 
ask the title company. They will have access to all of this. If you cannot find it, if it is not an association that has something online that you can readily get a link to, contact the title company because the title company is going to be able to pull this together. They have to have us to be able to secure the deed. So they can get this for you. You can attach it or have a link to it in your listing, and there you have it. Your buyer has completed whatever is needed. That, that's what you need to make sure that you do. On the buying side, if you are representing the buyer, you definitely want to make sure that if this was not part of what was made available to you, and meaning the seller hasn't pre-filled out some of this and it isn't attached in the listing, you as the buyer's representative need to make sure that you complete the first portion of this and send it over with your sell and purchase contract so that the seller can complete it. Okay, And I'm going to restate that one more time. Seller can complete it. Please, listing agents, don't ever complete this on behalf of your sellers. It's not your responsibility. All right, so you can complete the first portion of it there with the names and the um, property description and then the name of the community. And then if you look at all of these things, this says, as a buyer of property in this community, <coughs> excuse me, you will be obligated to pay a member homeowners association. It asks for that amount. It also asks, again, if there are other amounts that have to be paid. It looks for special assessments. And the biggest reason that I say that, that everybody should attach this is because it makes you aware of any of the restrictive covenants that may be applied to this. While not every home or residential property in the state of Florida has a homeowners association, almost everybody has some type of uh, restrictive covenant. So that's what this is going to make you aware of. The one thing I want you to note, and I pulled this up on the screen, do not have your buyer sign this when you send it. We all kind of get in that little mode. We've got all those papers. Buyer's got to sign a date, sign a date, sign a date. Please don't have them sign a date this one. They sign a date this one when they have received the information, they're good with it, then they sign and date it. So initially, whenever you attach this one, you fill up this top portion, you have your buyer initial, that they're sending it as part of the sell and purchase contract, but they do not sign and date it until they receive the information and that they're fine with it. Okay. If we move on to seller financing, I'm going to hope that you never use this. If you ever have a situation in which you have a seller who is truly planning to finance the purchase on their own, as this says, with a purchase money mortgage or security agreement, please, this needs to be something that is written up very specifically with all of the details spelled out by an attorney. I would never use this writer. Never. I would have that checked off in the sale and purchase agreement and an attorney needs to have written up all of that information. This, this, little, um, this little agenda is definitely not good enough for something like that. Same thing with the assumption of existing mortgages. Again, if there is going to be an assumption uh, that needs to be handled with the documentation provided from the lender itself. And again, I would never use this particular one. All right. Moving to the FHA and VA addenda. This is something that if you have a buyer who is securing FHA or VA financing, you definitely need to attach this. Again, you need to make sure that they understand. And here are a couple of things that are very important to point out on this one. If you look at number two, where it talks about inspections and appraisal, as it says, in addition to the requirements of paragraph 12 of the contract, so this is re relating back to the sell and purchase contract, seller shall comply with applicable FHA or VA regulations regarding termite inspection, roof inspection, and appraisal reports, collectively appraisal repairs. The cost to the seller for appraisal repairs shall not exceed and it says if it was if it is left blank, it is only $250. What you need to be very careful is that you're not writing something in on the sell and purchase contract that says 
that the seller is going to contribute up to, let's say, $800 towards any of these fees, and then leave this one blank, and now we're back to 250 Does that make sense? You have to have whatever numbers you're putting on the contract that say have to also be on this one. So you have to have, make these match because I'm going to go back to something I said right at the very beginning. Any of these supersede the contract. Okay, They override what's on that contract. So if you leave this one blank and you simply attach it and you put a different number there, this is the one that, that literally the title company is going to go by for closing. This is what your lender is going to go by for closing because that is what contract law says they have to do. So you've got to make sure these numbers all match. Make sense? Okay. And then it just kind of goes through with the fees, the, the repayments um, again. And I just want you to see that it, they're saying if you leave this, this one blank, it's only going to be $100. So please complete this. Make sure your numbers on here match um, with regard to what you're putting on the contract as well. Otherwise, you're going to end up hurting your uh, buyer in the long run. But there's nothing on here that's, I mean, any different than, than what you already know with regard to this. But you do definitely need to attach this. You definitely need to make sure that, that they're aware. I think one of the good things that it does do, if you look at this, it really spells out in a little bit more detail than the sell and purchase contract exactly what the seller is going to be paying for um, whenever the buyer is getting FHA or VA fine. And I don't think that that's a bad, idea, a bad thing. I think it just helps the seller to understand exactly what they're um, going to be doing. Okay? And then again, <coughs> excuse me, everybody has to sign this one. Okay. Appraisal contingency. Um, you all know that the sell and purchase contract clearly says that if our buyer can't get financing, that they're out of the contract. But it does not necessarily say in the sell and purchase contract that if they can get financing but the house doesn't appraise, they still can be locked into the contract. So this is your way to make sure if you're representing a buyer and you don't know that the house is actually going to appraise, especially if you've got somebody who's trying to buy the house for, um, let's say, the uh, at listed price or maybe a little bit more than that so that the, the seller can contribute money back towards their closing costs, this is a great one to put in there. It basically eliminates any question or concern. If the house doesn't appraise, your buyer's out of the contract. Okay, I personally think that this is a really good one to always put in, um, especially if your buyer is looking to maximize um, you know, the, the purchase price to be able to get some money back towards their closing costs. So I mean, and just so I'm making myself clear, house is listed for $150,000 and your buyer is trying to buy the house for $155,000 and they're asking for $10,000 towards uh, their closing costs. So the house would have to appraise for that. Um, short sale appro approval contingency. I don't think many people are doing a lot of short sales still at this point in time. That's a good thing. But if you are still working with short sales, then I would say that if you are, please make sure that you read this short sale approval contingency. It is, It was created for just that. Um, it actually says that the approval of the seller's lender and requirements for the sales approval and that the um, Trying to move this down a little bit so that you can see on number two, application for approval of short sale. Seller shall within, if it, you leave it blank, it's 10 days, after effective date, obtain from seller's lender their application forms for a short sale and shall or sell, seller shall diligently complete and return such forms and that they have to notify the buyer is the big thing. Um, and it goes on to, if you look down to number four, if the seller does not deliver a copy of the seller's accepted short sale approval to the buyer within 90 days, then you can, your buyer can get out of this contract. So I think that's probably the most important piece of this one, um, that it gives the buyer a way out if it seems to be taking a 
relatively long period of time and that you're not going, you're not hearing anything. Now, a caution on this. All of these should be attached to the initial sale and purchase contract. So it shouldn't be something that you started a contract and then you're trying to add these things onto it at a later date and time. These should be things that you as the professional are pre-thinking and that you're adding them to the contract from the get-go. And hopefully that makes sense to you. Okay. And the short sale approval contingency continued. This is also another huge piece of this and that I think is really nice is that it talks about backup offers. Um, the seller agreed not to accept other contracts or the seller's right to accept backup contracts. So this would be something obviously the listing agent is putting in there. But I think that it makes it very clear um, and allows your buyer some known capacities that if you again are still dealing with short sales, you definitely want to spend a little bit of time going through this one. I think this is a great addendum to be using if you're working with short sales. Okay, and the homeowner's insurance and flood insurance. I always think that this should be attached. Um, again, I noted my list of ones that I always felt should be attached to every sale and purchase contract. This is one of them. And again, just reiterating this for you all, the top portion of all of these should be completed with the buyer and the seller's names and the address of the property. And then your buyer would initially be um, putting their initials on here as it is part of the sale and purchase contract. So on the first part where we talk about homeowner's insurance, the buyer is unable to obtain homeowner's insurance using the windstorm from a carrier or from citizen's property insurance and that their premium should not exceed a certain amount. I think that is extremely important because we may have properties um, in times whenever we've had storms, we've had a lot of damage, like we have properties that are on the market now that may have been damaged um, in the storms that we had earlier, or I guess I should say late last year. It's very important for this. For those of you who have, a, have attended some other classes, if you go on the internet and you simply type in clue, C period, L period, U period, E period, you can go to a website <laughs> where you can actually look up a property address and it will tell you um, if there have been any insurance claims on that property in the last 18 months. And that's very important, when, especially when you've got folks that may have questionable credit um, or they don't have the most stellar credit because what the insurance companies do is they look at that and if that particular property has had some claims against it, they may increase the premium for that house. Um, so you need to be very careful that you understand if there's anything that you know is there and that could be the case but this allows your your buyers you know a way out that if you put an amount here based on you call three different insurance companies I should say you but they call three different insurance companies got some idea of what their premium should be you can put it on here and if it turns out to be you know two thousand dollars more than that then they can get out of the property um, because it's going to actually increase their mortgage payment um, flood insurance, again, I would, I would just always caution everybody on flood insurance. <laughs> you all know as real estate professionals that they every so often will change, especially when we have big storms. They will go back in and they will look at the topographical maps. And when they do that, they sometimes will change where they have flood zones. So we have insurance companies then that if we have a property that just a kind of the little tip of it now is in that flood plain. Now they're going to say that the house has to have flood insurance and the people who are living there maybe never had it before. So your buyer may be required to get it because the maps changed, not because the seller is trying to, you know, not disclose something because the seller may never have had to pay for it. So um, that can always happen. Just be aware of that. 
And um, again, flood insurance can be expensive, I know that, so it's always a good thing to put this in there and it allows your buyer a way out. Uh, allows them to terminate the, the contract if in fact that gets too pricey for them. Okay, and <clears throat> if we move on, um, if anybody is having money in an interest bearing account, this would be for the escrow deposit. This has to be uh, attached if the, if the buyer's escrow money is going into an interest bearing account. I don't think you have to worry about that too frequently, so we're not going to worry about that. This is also an addendum for as is. Um, the as is contract obviously should be used if you're if you are working with an as is property. This is just another layer of protection, if you will, that talks about the inspection period and the right to cancel. If I'm working with a buyer, um, I like to attach this just so my buyer understands again what they're purchasing. I know that may sound ridiculous, but I think that sometimes we're getting so many of the properties that are on the market right now that are, have an as-is contract, or that's what they say that they have an as-is contract. So I think we have negated the purpose of an as-is contract, so I just want to touch on that for a moment. An as-is contract is supposed to be used on a property where the seller is making no repairs. They're selling the house as-is. However, what I see as commonplace out there in the market is that listing agents are going in to take a listing and there are problems with the property that the seller makes them aware of and the listing agent is saying, we'll just sell the house as is. That is not what an as is contract is, folks. You still have the obligation, seller and realtor, have the obligation under Florida law to disclose any problems with the property. That is material fact. You must disclose it. So you can't say, the seller say, well, we know the house needs a new roof because we have water that leaks in every time it rains and you say, oh, no problem, let's just sell the house as is, and then the buyer is going to have to take the responsibility of it. No, your seller and you have the responsibility to say that there are known roof leaks in the home. But selling the house as is means that the buyer understands there is a problem, but the seller is not going to make the correction. Again, you still have to make the disclosure, okay? Still have to make the disclosure. There's no way around that. You're just saying we're not making the repair. And what this does is simply say, if you read this through, it, uh, on B it says, this writer does not release seller's disclosure obligations under paragraph 10J of the sale and purchase contract except as provided for in this rider. Seller has received no written or verbal notice from any governmental entity or agency as to currently correct, uncorrected building, environmental, or safety code violations. Seller extends and intends no warranty. So bottom line is every disclosure is made. Seller has given that freely to our buyer. They know of nothing else and for me, if I have a buyer who's buying a house as is, I'm going to attach this simply because it gives the seller more notice that they have to make those disclosures to my buyer. It gives my buyer another layer of protection that the seller had to disclose those things. Okay, and that my seller clearly or my buyer clearly understands the seller is not going to be making any of those repairs, but they may be there. And then if we go to number two on this, where it talks about the inspection period and right to cancel, buyer shall have, if left blank, 15 days from the effective date within which to have inspections made on the property um, to determine if they're okay moving forward. There is a, a limit, a dollar limit, and you all know that, that you should be placing on the as-is contract that my that your buyer literally says 
if the repairs go up to X amount of dollars or exceed X amount of dollars, then I'm not comfortable with it anymore and I'm out of the contract. Yeah. Um, the buyer. You know, I've had people that will, you know, that will put a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars on there, but they still end up buying the property. It just gives them the way out. That if they determine it's too much, they don't have to to move forward with the contract. So it's up to your buyer. But again, these are very important, and it, it again it tells them again and again and again that you know the seller has to make these disclosures. Um, and just so you all understand, this is another layer, but on the sale and purchase contract, you need to be very careful. There is the latent defects clause in both the as-is and in the regular FAR bar that clearly says that if the seller does not make the buyer aware of known problems with the property, the buyer purchases them and finds out later and they are things that should have been disclosed because they were known, the buyer has the right under Florida law to sue the seller up to five years. So by doing your seller's disclosure, by making these little extra efforts of one additional piece of paper, you are eliminating all of those things. So that's I, I just think that it's a... Uh, prudent on us as real estate professionals to understand and to be able to utilize these. This is the right to inspect and right to cancel. This can be used with the as-is, although the as-is already has this kind of built into it. But if you are doing a regular FAR bar, again, this is just another layer of protection. It says the buyer has the right to go in and, and have the home inspection done. This clearly says that in lieu of the inspection period set forth, buyer shall have 15 days from the effective date within which to have any inspection performed and let the seller know what they, what they feel. If this contract is terminated or the transaction contemplated by this contract does not close, buyer shall repair all damage to property resulting from buyer's inspections, which I think is very important for a listing agent to always have this as part of a contract for just that one specific thing there that they've gone in, they've looked at some things, they've decided they're going to do this or do that, they've cut holes in walls, and we all want to think that, oh, that's never going to happen. Folks, I can, I can give you a real life story here. I had one of my sales associates that um, I met folks and took, taken them out, looked at four or five different properties. They fell in love with one. They called them back and they said, hey, can we meet you um, out there? We want to take a, a second look at that property because we really think we're, you know, we're at a point we want to want to uh, write an offer. So he said, absolutely. They said, um, do you mind if we bring, um, you know, our brother-in-law because he's a contractor and we just like to get his opinion? Sure, okay, no problem. So he meets them there. They pull in with not one, but two van fulls of people, not just the brother-in-law. And as the potential buyers are asking some questions of my, uh, my sales associate, because he's got like 15 people in this house with him, and he's trying to herd them all around. But as he's answering some questions in one of the bedrooms, he hears a noise, and he goes out to find that said brother-in-law, who is a contractor, has produced a, um, a saw and has managed to cut an entire square of drywall out because he thought that there might be some moisture behind it. <laughs> um, try to explain that to a seller that you have a hole in your wall now that we have to get fixed. Oh, yes, and of course the buyers decided that wasn't really the right home for them, so they were going to keep looking. Um, so, yes, you can have all kinds of, of interesting things. I would say someday I'm going to write a book about all the interesting things that have happened over the last 30 years in real estate. But you definitely want to be in a position to have something that says that they come in, they decide they're going to do whatever, look at repairs, do this or that, and the contract falls flat, you're your seller has a recourse. So this is a very good agenda for you to consider attaching um, just to make sure 
that we don't ever have disputes. If I had a dollar for every student that has ever called me with a question about a dispute of something that arose as they're in the throes of sometimes just negotiations, they aren't even to contract yet, or from contract to closing, I'd be an extremely wealthy person. Um, so just saying, it, it, it can't hurt to be too cautious. I know sometimes you all want to say, well, I don't want to touch too many papers. It gets the, the buyer scared. I think it's the delivery. If you explain to somebody that you're adding this just as, an, as a precaution to make sure that the buyer has a way out of the contract or that the seller is held to something or to make sure that should something go wrong during this, this entire process, that instead of them getting into a dispute, you already have pre-laid the paperwork so that everybody knows how it's going to be handled. And everybody can walk away as maybe not friends, but certainly not enemies. And most importantly, and I would never tell you to tell your buyers and sellers this, but between all of us, the biggest reason that it eliminates you being in the middle. You have pre-thought things. You've had everybody sign it. If there becomes a dispute, all you have to do is say, folks, wait, time out. You already have this. Uh, you all signed it. This is what you agreed to. That's why we had this added into the contract. And it eliminates any of that upheaval that can happen. Because we all know this is a very emotional and, you know, commercial transactions, it's a business deal. But we're, we're dealing with people buying and selling houses Yes, it's a piece of property, but there's a lot of emotional strings attached. And when you've got that, and when something starts to go wrong, the emotions get very, very high. So if you can be the voice of reason, you already have pre-thought things, and you can add some things in that will just make it easier for everybody, and mostly yourself and the other realtor on the other side of the transaction, hey, why not? So use your tools. Um, you all know that this is also a requirement. Defective drywall, thank goodness, I think that all of this has been moved out um, of, the, of any kinds of, of problems. If you had a home, just to kind of dispel any concerns you may have with this, um, in 2006, we had, a, had um, drywall that had been brought over from um, out of country, and it had a lot of sulfuric acid in it. And because of that, it was uh, very uh, potent, and it was just deteriorating everything. And the biggest thing, the biggest way that you knew that a home had this drywall is that the coils of the HVAC would usually disintegrate, literally disintegrate, within about nine months to a year of any home that had this. Um, it was that potent on the on the the copper that's in them. So. Um, you, you know, you had some homes that it was really bad. I can't imagine as, as um, based on the smell and how the acid deteriorated various things in a home um, that you would in any way have a home with this still standing. But it was required for quite some time that we add this disclosure on anything that had been built in that uh, right around 2006 so but that's what this is for and as it clearly tells you um, I'm looking for the paragraph because I know that it's right in there it cause, uh, causes corrosion of air conditioner and refrigerator coils copper tubing electrical wire this kind of thing so um, again I, it would have been eliminated by now but just so you know why it's there and what it was for and as long as I've been in real estate, there's always been one thing that has been uh, a problem. Okay, I want to address the coastal construction uh, control line. This is pretty big. For those of you that work in areas where you are going to be um, working in coastal lines, you probably already are well aware of this, but you should definitely, definitely add this um, on anything. You know that the coastal lines change, especially whenever we have erosion of the beaches, those kinds of things. Um, so it is very important that you have this. That just, and again, this is just one of those takes the liability off of you. If you've made them aware, 
that this could change. There's nothing you can do about it. It's not a non-disclosure on you or anybody else's part um, <clears throat> because these things can actually change. That's what you really want to make people aware of. And um, just having the buyer note that and that you're going to have to get that information from the local authorities is really what you're doing. <clears throat> Insulation disclosure for a new residence. This is kind of um, uh, misleading, if you will. This is not for new construction, just so you understand this. This would be if a home had a recent addition to it or if we had a home that had had a lot of repairs on it, that's what this is for. I know it says for new residents, but please be aware that it is uh, not necessarily for anything that would be new construction as far as a whole house. It would just be if, again, addition or, um, and just so you're all aware, uh, anytime there is a new addition or a, um, a complete remodel, being done on houses. Building code at this point in time requires that all of the builders and HVAC contractors have to go through a process where they're getting a Florida code um, form. And that Florida code form will actually, there's a very specific software that has been created by UCF and the Florida Solar Energy Center and you have to use that software. That little uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet is kind of like a label that will be found there. It has to be done. They cannot get their permit without it. And so it is something that is required. It is required on new construction, but it is also required on any additions and again on anything uh, that um, you would have a major remodel on. It also requires that the HVAC contractor, prior to being able to get the um, permit for it, has to produce what is called a manual J that goes over to the local authorities with that energy code form, and that has to be part of the permitting process. And that's, what it's essentially saying is that all of the insulation and sealing of that addition or remodel has, meets current code and that the calculation for the sizing of the heat and air has been done to match that. And that all has to be part of the permitting process at this point in time. That went into effect last year. Um, we will be tightening that again, um, especially with respect to brand new construction in July of this coming year, July of 2017. So um, this is kind of obsolete, if you will, but um, if you feel that perhaps a remodel has not been done and you don't know that information or it's not been done properly, it might be a good idea to attach this so that you can get that. Anytime that you have somebody saying that they remodeled, they made this addition, they did whatever. As a listing agent, I think this is one of the things that you have to do. I know we all want to believe that people are not telling us falsehoods, but please don't think it's that they're, they're lying to you. It's just that they may not know. But you should know that if you go into the public records, into the appraiser's website, and you pull up that particular property that you're about to take the listing on, you can go in, doesn't matter what county in Florida that you go into, you can pull all of the permits. So if they tell you that this used to be a porch and we've now created it into the sunroom and we put heat and air into it um, in the last 12 months, and you go into property appraisers and you do not see any permit for that, then it's illegal. It wasn't permitted. So now we've got a problem because once the appraiser comes out and finds that, that could stop the entire process altogether. We once had a house here in Orange County, um, I guess actually I'm standing in Osceola County, um, but in Orange County where the homeowner had purchased the property from her son who had originally put a deck on, the, got a permit to put a deck. Once they had the deck, they must have decided, oh, let's put a roof on it. Then once they had a roof on it, he had some buddies, they put sides on it, they knew about a guy who did heating and air, so they put heating and air in it, and it was this 400 square foot sunroom. Beautiful addition to this home. Very nicely done. However, there was no permit. 
my sales associate did not check to see if there was a permit prior to taking the listing. We took the listing, got an offer, went to contract, go to the appraisal process, the appraiser stops everything because, hey, there's no permit on that, and Orange County um, made us have that entire thing removed because the wooden deck was not permissible per code for a substructure for a room. So everything came down. We lost the buyer, obviously. Um, but you know, we should have we should have checked first. So that's the message here. Always be prudent in what you're doing as a professional and make sure that you're you know, crossing your T's and dotting your I's. Okay, go ahead. Nothing ever permitted. Nothing. And then last year they did all the roof, and I wasn't full of permits either. It was like freaking out because now. Yeah, yeah. The house is not, it has no permit on it. That's, uh, just so everybody could hear on the webinar, the, the comment was that the original house was only a one bedroom, one bath house, and um, there had been a big addition added on two additional bedrooms. And in the 60s, no permits, no anything, because there probably wasn't building code at that point in time. But it was never anywhere, and nobody knows if it's if, if it's accurate or not. Then uh, a year or so ago, the entire house needed a new roof. New roof was put on, no permits for that either. And um, yeah, now there's a, a big problem on that listing because, quite honestly, uh, you're not going to get it approved for financing. It's a big thing. So unless somebody is willing to purchase it cash, there's no way that it's going to be purchased. And that's the big thing that we run into with all of these. I mean, keep in mind, again, always be very careful when you're, when you're dealing with some of this right now. Um, you know, we had some major storms with a lot of homes with property damages. And anytime we have that where trees fell down and we have all these people coming in and you have all the roofing crews running around, I understand that the homeowner is saying, look, I don't want to have water. If it rains tomorrow, I can't afford to have water coming in and destroying my home. So yeah, if you can fix it today, go for it. But when there's no permit pulled and that was fixed, unfortunately, there's going to be a problem with it down the road. Um, you know, And if they had to you know, change out any wiring or do anything like that, we really have a lot of problems. So the biggest one, because it's in something that I, I do with my energy rating, uh, is HVAC. I deal with that a lot. Any time that any portion of the heating and air conditioning system is going to be changed, repaired with uh, another piece of machinery, there has to be a permit hold. Has to be. That is state code in Florida. And just think of why, because that whole heating and air conditioning system affects so many things in any home, um, especially for us relative to mold and those types of things. There has to be a permit pulled. And so if you've got an HVAC contractor out there doing things, replacing the inside unit, outside unit, ducts, whatever, and no permit was pulled, there's going to be a real problem with that. Okay, so be very careful. Um, ask your questions when you're taking the listing and make sure that you are getting your seller to disclose all of these things up front so that you don't have an issue uh, if you get a potential buyer or don't take the listing is the other option. Um, <clears throat> on to lead-based paint. You all know this one. You learned it in pre-license class. Please make sure that you remember it. Any house built prior to 1978, you must must, 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 must. This is this one is not just Florida law. This is federal law. Okay, this is federal law. So you need to make sure that you do this on a couple of levels. If you are the listing agent and you see that the house was built prior to '78, you need to have a conversation with your seller. You need to ask them if they've made any upgrades in the home. Anything. It needs to be put very clearly 
into listings if the house was built prior to 78. You need to download the um, from EPA. They have a have a little brochure that has to be given to the buyer. It is currently done in English and in Spanish, but you can make sure that that is available. I would just attach it to my listing. The buyer has to receive that pamphlet. The buyer has to be given the disclosure. The buyer has to be told that they have the opportunity for the inspection within 10 days. The very important part of this, if you are a buyer's representative, and I don't see this as a you know that big of a deal. I understand we have a lot of older homes, and this is about the paint that's you know 12 layers deep on that wall. But here's the bigger thing: that if your seller or you as the real estate professional, and this one falls because it's federal law, falls squarely on our shoulders as the real estate licensed professional. That if we don't make sure that all these things are done, and something becomes of that and somebody becomes harmed, then everybody gets sued for treble damages, which is three times the actual dollar amount of any of the repairs. So that's pretty hefty. The buyer purchasing that home needs to also know that if they hire any contractors into that home to do any work that is going to require that contractor when they're replacing windows, they're cutting a hole in the drywall to um, add speakers or um, something where they're adding in for uh, cable television or mounting the, uh, the, the, the big um, TV. Anything like that where they are going to be touching a surface that could be contaminated with lead because of the age of that property, if the buyer does not make that, that contractor aware of that, and that contractor does not take the proper measures to secure themselves or any of their workers, and somebody gets sick, again, it's a trouble damages. So be very careful on this one. Make sure everybody is knowledgeable of it. Make sure they understand. Give them the pamphlet. Let them know. Um, keep the pamphlets with you. Again, they're in digital format, so you can send somebody a link. Um, and that might be one of those easy links to um, have on your website for yourself so that people can be aware of it. But this must be completed, must be signed, must accompany the contract, and both the lender and the title company must be given copies of this one. Again, this is a, this is a federal requirement, so please make sure that you're doing this. And sometimes I know people just don't even think. We had a downtown house that... Um, that was uh, built circa 1928. Our buyer put an offer in. I asked for the lead-based paint disclosure, and the listing agent told me that she didn't need one. And I said, um, I believe 1928 is before 1978. Anyhow, you get where I'm going. So you definitely need to make sure that you, again, are knowledgeable. Um, the next one, the housing for older persons, I think is a very good disclosure to use. And it just makes people aware. And I'm going to um, make sure that you understand why this is important. We have some of the communities that are um, age restricted. And you know age is not a protected class. So if half of Florida would just have to drop off the face of the planet. So age is not a restricted class. That's why we have all of the different communities that have, they are 55 plus or 62 plus. Unfortunately, due to some of the um, economy issues that some of these particular subdivisions that were originally built and are still 55 plus or 62 plus communities, but they are not on the national registry of retired communities because that is, there are certain other things that they had to do, and there's a fee to be on there. So a lot of them gave up being on that registry. So if you're looking only at that, you may not find them listed. But if they are in their restrictive covenants, actually a 55-plus a or 62-plus community, then you need to make sure that your buyer understands. Because here's the difference. 
In a 62 plus community, everybody living in the household must be 62 or older. In a 55 plus community, it says that the homeowner, at least one of them, must be 55. Some of these communities, though, if you look at this, it basically says one of the people owning the property must be 55. Also has limitations on how long you can have um, underage people so that they don't have like grandchildren that move in and that kind of thing. But I guess the, the big case that came up a few years ago was in um, the villages, and in that particular case, it was that the wife was the one that was over 55, the husband was not. The wife unfortunately passed away. The husband had 18 months before he would be 55 and the villages basically said that he had to move out of the house because according to their restrictions there was nobody that was an owner of that property that was over 55 living in the property. So there was, you know, my in-laws at that time lived in the villages, and so there was just controversy every day. My mother-in-law loved um, emailing me all of the different things. There was an all-out campaign to find him a, a new wife that was over 55. It was really hilarious. But <laughs> the bottom line was that it was a big controversy, and it was basically that, the, that you know people were beating up like, wait a minute, the guy just lost his wife, this is horrible. But on the other hand, that's what the restrictive covenants were, and he knew that when they purchased the property. So um, please make sure that folks understand what they're getting themselves into. It's just a way for them to dig a little bit deeper and find out all of the requirements of that community before they purchase, and um, so that they don't don't get themselves into something that maybe isn't going to be a good fit. The rezoning contingency, um, folks, if people are buying a property based on the fact that they want to have it rezoned, please make sure that this is attached so that they understand all the parameters of it may not happen. Um, and the problem with somebody doing this, they don't always understand the time frame involved with getting something like that pushed through. It's not something that's easy, especially the smaller the municipality that you're dealing with, the more difficult it's going to be. So um, that is not an easy thing to get through, and, and it is something that they need to be well aware of, that if it's a, a requirement of purchase. This one has been coming up a lot, lease purchase, lease option. Um, I, again, I think that everybody needs to understand what the differences are between a lease purchase, lease option. And the big difference is, obviously, that, that if people are leasing a property um, with an option on it, it means that a portion of the, month, the, the monthly rent that they're paying is going towards fulfilling the option amount. The option amount, again, going back to your free license days, is an amount that the seller is going to get. If the buyer chooses to not purchase the property at the end of the option period, usually a year, then the seller gets to keep all of that money. Um, but this has to be written up differently. There should be two agreements. There should be a lease agreement and a purchase contract or a lease agreement and an option contract. Those are two separate agreements. You cannot, again, you cannot create these, so please do not use a sell and purchase agreement and think that you're going to attach this. If I had one that I could just put a big X through, this would be it, because if you have somebody who is going to go with a lease purchase or a lease option, then those are two separate agreements. You need to have them drawn up by the lease, drawn up by an attorney, or use one that you have pre-done um, and the purchase agreement and they are separate documents. Uh, same with lease and the option. You cannot write an option contract. You have to have an attorney write an option contract. Um, if I had other ones that should have come with a big caution sticker on them, this would be it. The pre-closing occupancy by a buyer, this is a really bad, bad, bad idea. Um, please, if you ever have a reason why the buyer is going to be in the property, and I don't care if it is for, for two weeks, two days, 
please have a lease agreement that is drawn up with a definite termination date and that discusses all the parameters of who is responsible for what. Do not, and I'm going to say this again, do not use this. You need to have an actual lease agreement that is separate from your sell and purchase contract um, so that your seller, if they're letting these people move in, on the outside chance that the deal doesn't go through and the buyer does not purchase, the seller has a way to get the people out of the property. This is not inclusive enough to do this. And it follows through on this one that if the seller is going to be staying in the property after we close, same thing, there should be a uh, lease agreement that says the very specifics of when the seller must be out and how they're paying rent and um, so on and so forth. Okay. Sell of the buyer's property. This one is very important. This is a contingency. I see a lot of times whenever people will say that the buyers are paying cash because they've got their house in Connecticut on the market for sale. That is not paying cash. That is a contingency. So if that is not disclosed to a seller, then you've done something wrong. So you need to make sure that if your buyer is purchasing this property, even if they're going to have enough proceeds from the sale of another home to pay cash, but they are definitely, um, they definitely have another property on the market for sale. So you need to make sure that that is there. And we need to talk about the backup contract and the kickout clause. So I know these come one before the other. I'm going to go to the kickout clause first, and then we're going to go to the backup contract. I personally think that this is something that every listing agent should have every single time that they are taking a listing, that they discuss this kickout clause with their seller so that it can be part of any sales contract that comes through. And it basically says that the seller would have the right to continue to show the property and solicit and enter into bona fide backup purchase contracts with third parties that are subject to the termination of this primary contract. Upon entering into a backup contract, seller will give the buyer a copy of the backup contract with the third party's identification and purchase price obliterated. To continue this primary contract, the buyer must, keep in mind that it says must, make an additional deposit of and basically eliminate any and all contingencies on that contract. So if I have a listing, I get an offer, before my seller accepts the offer, I send back a counter offer with the kickout clause basically allowing me to continue to accept other contracts on it, knowing that if I get a better one, that the current buyer knows that we're going to show them, they're going to give us an additional $5,000 that my seller gets to keep, and they have to say we're eliminating all other contingencies and we're moving forward with this. Or if they cannot do that or do not want to, then the other contract take, takes precedence. Now, having said that, let's go back up here to the backup contract. This backup contract is subject to the termination of a prior executed contract, meaning that we are not talking about offers, we're talking about a contract between the seller and a third party for the sale. If the prior executed contract is terminated and seller delivers written notice of the termination to the buyer before 5 p.m. on whatever date, this contract shall be removed and this backup contract shall be put into first position. So you have to have both of them. What ends up a lot of times happening is the listing agent gets a feeling that the contract isn't going to move forward, it's never going to close, now they don't know what to do, how they're going to get other offers on their particular property, and had they, upon that initial offer being accepted and going to contract, simply attached this and had the buyer sign it, saying they were okay with it, then they would have the opportunity to take backup contracts. So they go hand in hand, but it cannot be something that you try to do at the end. It has to be something that was done whenever you initially got an offer on a property. Okay? I think those are the two. The two addenda that would save a lot of heartache 
for a lot of listing agents and a lot of sellers if we just use them effectively. But I see very few listing agents that do. Okay. Um, seller's attorney approval, again, this is something that you would typically use in the um, time whenever the seller is not going to be available um, or that we have a situation where it's an estate sale, something of that. Sometimes um, investment properties that um, we're simply putting on there that the attorney has to use this. Anytime that you're dealing with a short sale <clears throat> or a foreclosure, um, this would be used as well because the attorney has to give the third party approval on it. And same thing with the buyer's attorney on that if there's a certain situation to be used on it. And <clears throat> this one is very important to all of us. Licensee disclosure of personal interest has an active or an inactive real estate license and has a personal interest in the property. Spe specify if licensee is related to a party or is acting as the buyer or the seller. Folks, this is one of those things that can cause you to face the Florida Real Estate Commission if you are involved in a real estate transaction and you have not used this and here are the, the, the places or times whenever you would use this. If you are representing your brother, sister, mother, father, even I usually say as far as cousin in the property, you need to have this saying, look, I have a familial relationship with this person or if it's your best friend, you need to make sure that you have this. Anytime that you are the buyer or the seller in a transaction, you are considered, even if uh, you know somebody has an inactive license, they are still considered to have more knowledge than the average buyer or seller, and therefore they must disclose that they have a real estate license. So this one is very important. The other time that you would use it, let's say that you have just simply met this, these people and one of them says, oh, I got my real estate license five years ago, but then market changed and I, I, just, I still have it, um, but it's just inactive then this has to be used so that the, the, you know, the buyer or the seller on the other side of the transaction knows that one of the parties has a real estate license. So those are all the reasons that must be used. And technically, law says that you have to put it in bold you know, in the contract, but as long as you are attaching this, this separate addenda where everybody has to sign off, they're notified. So it's important that you use it. Um, if we're going to arbitration instead of mediation, you would use this. That's really what this says. Um, that, and I don't know that you would necessarily have that. Now, a couple other ones that I think are very important. I'm going to start with this. I want you to notice what this says on it. It says counter offer. I want to talk about the counter offer form. The counter offer form is used for that. It is before we go to contract. So we've sent an offer to the listing agent. The listing agent says that the seller is okay with the offer. They have a couple of changes that they want to make. Here is the suggestion that they use the counter offer form. Typically, if I'm sending over an offer, I will call the listing agent to let them know that I'm emailing over my buyer's offer and I will say that I've also attached a counter offer form just in case there are any changes that your seller wants to make to the original offer. If you look at this, it says that this is, there's either a rejection of the offer or here are the terms. The counter offer consists of all terms of the offer with specific modifications to particular clauses as follows. And we all know that the FAR bar contract has every single line of the contract has a number, correct? So you write the number and you write what the new, what you want it changed to. So it makes it very clean and clear what we're changing. If your buyer wants to change something else, they send it back. So we have acceptance and, and expiration of the counteroffer and write your, write your withdraw the counteroffer. 
everything is clearly there. It's all done. Everybody is signing this. Everybody is sending this over. We have a paper trail that we can very clearly see what the changes were made, and then we take out, you know, the, the final, everybody's gone back and forth, we know exactly what happened, we make the final changes that everybody's agreed upon, and that's how our new contract is going to be. <coughs> but, excuse me, it has a place to sign and a place to date. So, you have a clear paper trail of what was discussed. So many times when you're in one of those particular um, negotiation periods where things are going back and forth and back and forth, it gets really difficult to remember exactly who said what, and you should never be doing this verbally, which I see a lot of that happening. So this eliminates any of the verbal back and forth, one piece of paper, not the entire contract back and forth or all this discussion, one piece of paper, make the change, send it over, okay, I'm okay with that, but not the second comment that they wanted, so I want to change that to this, send it back again. We have three pieces of paper. Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. They're, we have a clean, crisp timeline of what was changed, and now we can make the actual changes. Um, because we all know that going back and forth on the phone just creates a lot of problems. And I don't want to be sending 17 to 22 pages worth of stuff back and forth, even if it's in an email. I would really prefer that we um, can keep it down to one piece of paper. So, but again, it's a counter offer. A lot of times I hear people make the comment that they are negotiating a contract. Folks, that's impossible. You don't negotiate the contract. You are negotiating an offer. It isn't until it's completely negotiated that you have a contract. So please use the correct terminology. Because from my standpoint as a real estate educator who teaches pre-licensed classes, I have so many of the people coming into a pre-licensed class that the reason that they're getting their license is because they feel that somebody didn't share with them the correct information when they recently had a real estate transaction. And usually those are the kind of comments that I hear that, well, we were negotiating the contract and then it just all fell apart and that next thing I know, we didn't get the house. That could have been eliminated if it had just been explained properly because nobody was negotiating a contract. The reason they didn't get a house is they were doing counter offers and their offer didn't get accepted and there was no contract. But because the real estate professional said, well, we're negotiating your contract, the folks already assumed that they were under contract to purchase a house. That's our fault by misusing terminology. So when you are using paperwork that clearly shows that we are still in an offer stage and we are not yet to contract, I think that it helps you to remember what stage you're in, use the correct terminology, and it also allows your customers and you've heard me say that word again and again and again and again today, and I cannot tell you how strongly I feel that you have got to learn to change your terminology. You at La Rosa Realty do not have clients because you do not work as single agents. You are working as transaction brokers, which is the best way to work with buyers and or sellers. So please, make sure you are referring to them as customers. You do not have fiduciary responsibilities to these people, and you do not want them. Um, you don't want to be in that situation. So please, use correct terminology so that you are handling this properly. Okay, so that's our whole counter offer. Again, if you've got questions or concerns, don't be afraid to ask. Send me them in an email so that I can address them for you and make sure that you understand everything. Okay, now, here is an addenda to the contract. And the addendum to the contract is just that. So if we have a contract, buyer and seller have signed, everything's under contract, we're moving forward with it, and something needs to change, like we have the home inspection done and the home inspector finds out that we need to have a new roof put on. And that's certainly going to fall outside of the guidelines of the you know $1,000 repair limit that was set. 
Um, and the seller says, okay, that they're okay to do that. Um, or however we're going to handle that. If we need to change a closing date, whatever we might need to do, that's what you use the addenda to the contract. But I want to, again, be extremely careful on this. You're going to notice, folks, you got a lot of blank space here. So I always caution you. Here's my, my how I usually say it to all sales associates. You need to make sure that if you're going to write more than five consecutive words in that blank space that you've talked with somebody, your broker, an attorney, somebody, to make sure that what you're about to put in there is not going to negate or otherwise hurt the rest of the body of the contract. So be very careful. It gives you a lot of space, but don't start adding it. Be very concise in what you write. Um, Things that might need to, uh, you know, that you might need to change that you didn't realize. They didn't put that the that the security system was rented and not owned. They forgot to put that down, and your um, buyer definitely wants the security system. So you need to. You've already called the security company. Says it's no problem. We can have this shift made from one to the other, and so you just want to make sure that you're adding in here as an addendum to the contract that the security system is, gonna, is going to move to being the responsibility of the buyer effective midnight on whatever date. Um, something like that. Be very concise what you put on here. Don't be adding a lot of things. Don't make it, you know, and please don't ever use this, those, those words that this will supersede the contract. Nothing supersedes the contract. Do you understand that? An addendum will supersede it, but or will but what you're really putting in there is that something is going to live on beyond the contract. That's not possible by Florida contract law. When that contract ends, everything ends. You can't have something else continue on after that. It doesn't happen unless it is within the body of that contract. So um, please don't ever put those kinds of words in there because it's not going to happen. However, you do have instead of an addendum to the contract, and sometimes folks are not aware that this exists, you do have an extension addendum to contract. So if you need to change the closing date, you check it and you add that. Uh, financing period, because they need more time to get their loan approval. Inspection period, um, they need an additional number of days for some reason. Title cure, short sale, feasibility study, or due diligence. Um, usually the last two are not for residential properties. But any of those, you have one that is already pre-done, so instead of even finding wording, you can just check the box and you can use this one. So know that that is also an, a, an option as opposed to using just your addendum. And then one of the other final ones that I really want to uh, look at is this one. You all know if you take a listing that you have to use the uh, addenda that says that we have a foreign seller. So if we're using that, we should also make sure that our buyer has signed this. That the buyer is aware that the real property that they are having, they may be required to have a withholding on it. Because you know if our seller is a foreign seller, the way that the federal government has written FERPTA, it says that the withholding is from the buyer. Normally we negotiate that in the contract. Now we also know that if the sale price does not exceed $300,000, then it doesn't matter. But again, I always think that it's very important for our buyer to understand it's a withholding. It doesn't mean that they are going to have to pay that amount. It means that it will be withheld from the sale, it will be evaluated, and it very likely may end up coming back to them, but that it has to be withheld from the sale. So, again, just be aware that, um, you know, this is important. I do want to point out that uh, number five on this says that I understand that if the information in this affidavit is incorrect, I may be liable to the Internal Revenue Service for up to 10% of the sales price, plus interest and penalties. And um, it was not disclosed on a property uh, that I had a student contact me on from up in the Claremont area. It was not disclosed. Somehow the title company didn't see this. 
the buyer six weeks after moving into their new home got a letter from the IRS that they owed $30,000 within the next 15 days because it wasn't disclosed that the seller was a uh, foreign seller, but whenever the transaction went through, apparently that's when it was caught. Remember all those papers that you sign at closing that says that the title company has that 45-day grace period to fix anything? Well, they apparently caught it at that point in time. It went in for the notification. Seller is already out of the country, and any time that the seller is a foreign seller, everything falls back to the buyer. So it became a, a, not a fun situation for that real estate licensee or that real estate uh, brokerage firm to deal with, because or, or the title company. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, because the the buyer immediately contacted an attorney, um, you know, and they were all held liable. So this is again, this is a protection. You know, anytime I come before any of you. Uh, in any of these classes, that's kind of the one of the the roles that I accept. That my job is to make sure that I advise you of things that could help you to stay out of liable situations. My hope is that everybody consistently has great opportunities in real estate, makes a lot of money, has a lot of repeat business, and makes all these wonderful opportunities for themselves and for their customers. But um, as a part of that, we deal with a lot of legal things happening in a real estate transaction. So uh, just to make sure that we always have those, those great, wonderful opportunities available to you, we need to talk about liabilities that you can stay away from. And this is definitely one of them. So again, you know, find, um, find all of these, find this comprehensive rider, um, pull it up, look at it, go through all of these, be aware of all of this. And please make sure that you, you know, are comfortable with this. The other kind of final comment as we, we are finishing up today's session, any time that you are working with someone that English is not their first language, I feel that I should always caution you because as a real estate professional, you know clearly that Florida real estate license law does not permit you under any circumstances to be the person who interprets contracts. You are not permitted to do that. I also know that there are a number of times that because you are dealing with someone and you fluently speak a language that they speak, you kind of say, well, they can't really read it in English. They don't understand it in English. But if I share it with them in Spanish or Portuguese or um, you know Chinese or whatever, they will understand it better. No, because you are now interpreting a contract for them, and you don't have any ability to do that. If you're not allowed to do it in English, you're not allowed to do it in any other language. You can, however, make alliances with real estate attorneys who have paralegals, a lot of the, um, the larger real estate firms downtown Orlando have all of these, have the addenda, have the far bar contract already translated into numerous languages that they can send over to you or your customers. The customer is still going to have to sign the one that is in English, but at least they can read it in their native language. And just for me, I don't speak any other languages. But reading legalese in English, I sit there going, what does that mean? So I can understand how they can be confused, especially if they're coming from a country where you don't use contracts like this. So it's a really something different for them. So I understand where their concerns are. Your job is to get them to the correct people to help them. So seek out those firms, get the contracts written in another language so that they can read them in a language that's more comfortable to them, that's already pre-translated. Those of you, however, Spanish is always going to be translated into Castilian Spanish, which I know presents a whole other problem because so many dialects of Spanish exist. So some of the words are not going to match up. But there's where, if at least you give it to them in Spanish, they can probably get the gist. And there is a paralegal typically at that law firm that if they have specific questions on the meaning of something, that person can communicate with them and answer. 
And that's really what you have to do. I do understand there's an additional charge that's going to be incurring to your, your buyer on that, but please do not overstep your boundaries and advise people to do things. Um, we are seeing from, you know, as a, again, as a real estate licensed instructor here in Florida, the number of complaints that DVPR is seeing coming through on things like that where we have people that English is not their first language, they were advised by a real estate professional in a transaction and advised because they spoke the same language and that real estate professional um, used their ability to speak that other language to interpret things. There are a number of complaints coming through DBPR on that and DBPR is moving forward to reacting. Um, so let's be prudent, let's be careful, let's not be doing things. Um, I know we've done the property management class here a number of times. That is probably the other area where they are, um, DVPR is saying that they are seeing a lot of um, miscommunication being handled with particularly our customers who are not English speaking as a first language and that they're being misguided and taken advantage of. So if you are unsure on some of those, we do have any of these classes, in particular the property management class, has been recorded. They're on Resio. Please ask your um, broker at your office how you can go to those. They are all on the education tab. Um, go there, review it watch the video, watch the, um, watch everything, and if you have questions, you always have my contact information, so you, you know, feel free to reach out, and if I can help you, I will. But it's important that you do your due diligence um, so that you aren't getting yourself in any problems, the company in any problems, most importantly, that you don't, just because you didn't know or understand that you're harming a customer, because I firmly believe with all of my heart but there is nobody within La Rosa that would, would actually go out and try to do anything wrong. Um, but, hey, we all make mistakes. So the goal is, the more informed we are, the fewer mistakes that we can possibly make. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your time. And I'm going to pop this back up here for those that, of you who did not um, <clears throat> get the contact information. There it is. If you have questions or concerns, please understand I am not your broker, so I cannot tell you how to complete a contract. But if you have questions or concerns regarding any of the addenda, the contract, anything like that that I might be able to help you with, feel free to reach out. Again, please put in your subject line student with a question so that I know to respond to you. And I hope you all have an extremely wonderful and prosperous day and a great start to this great new year. And I look forward to seeing you back over the next few months. Yes. 